Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so it's really my pleasure to give the first talk. Uh, and so today I'll talk about Brahmanian abstraction for local global principle. And actually Brahmanian abstraction is one special case of the so-called cohomological abstractions. And so we'll first introduce the problem of uh, local global principle and why sometimes it fails and how can we uh, detect uh, the failure by abstractions coming from cohomology. And then we'll give some examples about possibly uh, explicit calculations. And then if there is still time, I can show some of my recent results and uh, on some uh, um, abstractions on other kinds of fields, um, the so-called geometrical uh, geometrical function fields. Okay, so we'll start about, um, we'll start. So let K be a field. And so of course, in the classical setting, K is just uh, the field of rational numbers. And then we want to solve um, a system of polynomial equations. And then we want to find out if there are integer solutions or not. Or more generally, we want to talk about rational solutions. And actually with the language of geometry, so this system of polynomial, polynomial equations defines a variety and then we want to know if there are rational points on this variety, which is exactly the same notion as rational solutions for the system of polynomial equations that we, divide, uh, that we denote by x of k. So this is the set of rational points. So the basic question is, is the set of rational points non-empty? And if it, it is non-empty, can we measure uh, the size of this set, which means that is it finite? Is it like finitely generated, or can we compare it to some other size, uh, some other uh, um, some other sets? And then, so one very natural way, like one necessary condition, is if we have a solution of a Q, and then we must get a solution over every completion of this field. And so for example, if we have in mind, this is Q, we should have solutions in all of the periodic fields QP and also in R. Okay, so this is one natural necessary condition that uh, it should satisfy in order to have a, a global solution. And so this is the so-called local information and this is the global information. So global, a solution implies local solutions. Global points imply local points. And then the question is, does the converse hold? Which means that if we do have local solutions everywhere, if we do have local points everywhere, do we have global solutions? Okay, so this is the definition of local global principle. Okay, so suppose that we have a family of varieties, F, and we say that this family satisfies local global principle. Um, so there's a problem of, uh, so, <laughs> oops. Okay. Yes, there is a problem that I I cannot share the screen. L'animateur a désactivé le partage d'écran par les participants. Okay. Okay, 
Let me see a cap. Okay. Okay, we're back. Okay, so this is the definition of local global principle for a family of varieties. Why we talk about a family of varieties? Because given one variety, of course, if there exist, if there is global point, there is always. I mean, we cannot talk about how to detect the existence. So if we have a family of varieties and we say that the local global principle holds for this family, if for any variety in this family, the variety admits um, local points everywhere for all the local places. And then we can know that there exists a global solution. And in this case, we say that the local global principle is satisfied for this family of varieties. Okay, so this omega, so we denote by the set of places or the set of valuations, if you want. So in the case for Q, so this set is all of the prime numbers and the so-called uh, infinite place where we have a completion uh, equal to R. Okay, so this is the local global principle and examples. So the most famous example is quadratic forms. And so this is the haas minkowski theorem. which says that if we have a quadratic form, and so um, we have non-trivial solutions over Q, if and only if we have um, solutions over all of the periodic fields and R. And actually, this is somehow the best we can hope for because very soon we just encounter counter examples to, uh, local, um, to local global principle. For example, um, if we look at the solutions defined of this shape. Okay, I will not go into details why there isn't a, a global solution because later on we'll see that actually we can explain it using the Brahman obstruction. Okay, so this is the problem of um, local global principle. And then I'll give the definition of weak approximation. This is also some notion that we've seen in algebraic number theory, at the very first course of algebraic number theory is that if we are given a finite number of local points, so which means that, for example, uh, if we are given just like a finite number of periodic, uh, periodic numbers, can we approximate this collection of local numbers by a rational number? If it is true, we say that uh, the brick approximation is satisfied. And for number fields, we, we know that if we just have um, uh, a finite number of uh, local numbers like this, we do have weak approximation. And in our term, which means that the projective line or the projective space satisfies weak approximation. And so actually, we say that weak approximation is satisfied if the closure of global points is equal to the product of all the local points. So here, for example, this is equipped naturally with the v adic analytical topology. So in the case of periodic fields, uh, so our fields has a topology and so it induces a topology on this set of local points. And then this is taken to be the product topology. So which means that we just look at a finite number of open subsets at one time. And so this translates exactly to the problem that do, can we approximate a finite set of local points by a global point? And so if this is satisfied, we say that weak approximation satisfies for this variety X. And of course, in this case, we suppose already that the set of global points is not empty. Okay, so we talk about weak approximation only if we have global points. Otherwise, we cannot talk about it if this is empty. Okay. And so we have examples. So famous examples are semi-simple, simply connected groups or that we've seen, or just like the most famous example in algebra number theory is just the projective space, because like we've seen that just for a collection of local numbers, we can approximate it by a global one. 
Okay, of course. And then we want to know about the obstruction. If this doesn't hold, can we still describe this set by some subsets of this, topolo uh, of this product topology? So which means that we want to find some subset in between these two sets, which explains why sometimes this equality doesn't hold because this is contained in some proper subset in this set. And for local global principle, it's the same. Actually, we want to find some proper subset of the set of local points, which contains this one, which gives more restrictions on the set of global points. And this obstruction actually comes from cohomological groups. And because in number fields, they have cohomological dimension two, and so we'll work a lot with H2, so the second cohomological group. And so it has another name, the Brow group. Okay, so for, uh, for field K, so the Brow, Brow group of K, I think you guys have already seen this definition more or less. It's the set of central simple algebras, module equivalence conditions. The equivalence conditions being that A is equivalent to B if and only if tensoring sum uh, matrix algebra, uh, they are isomorphic. Okay. And also we know that they can be uh, represented by some division algebra. And so actually it's the set of central division algebras. And but until now, there's no cohomology coming to play. And so why we call it a cohomological um, um, obstruction is because actually one other, another very important description is in terms of the Galois cohomology. So this is the group cohomology of the absolute Galois group with the module being the set of invertible elements. Okay, so this is our set of bar groups. And of course, like the first question is what kind of elements are there inside? Do we have explicit descriptions of them? And so what elements are there? Like examples in bar group, of course, like our favorite example, quaternion algebras. So if we have A and B, which are invertible elements in K modulo squares, because like uh, up to a square, they define the same um, quaternion algebra. So we denote by A and B, the algebra generated by, so I'll just write down the formula that you guys are already very familiar with. So this defines a central, central simple algebra. But then in terms of cohomology, because we've seen that actually this element lies in H2. And actually, how do we describe this element in H2? Actually, this is the so-called um, Galois symbols um, that, that we have from uh, Milner K theory. But actually, so here A, lies in this set. Actually, we can just uh, uh, write it as um, H2 of two, I'll write like this. So actually we have a cup product between A and B, and this gives rise to an element in the two torsion bar group of in the two torsion part of the bra group, so which we denote by AB. So actually now we have like a more concrete description in the sense that we just take one element in A, which is an invertible element in the field, and also another element in B, which is also another invertible element. And so we just take the pro cup product, it induces another, another element in H2. So here actually what we should have in mind is H2. And since this lies in the two torsion parts, and also it's to make these coefficients uh, coincide. And so here, it's the two torsion uh, parts of the bar group. And so we have a more explicit uh, description and even better, actually, we can describe this set using a presentation. Actually, this is just generated by all of the symbols
like this modulo equation, uh, modulo relations generated by symbols like this. And then this is tors two torsion, and so we just uh, and, and uh, okay, how do we say? Okay, and then we just module two. Okay, in some sense that okay. So actually, we have a very concrete description of this group. Uh, so in this sense, we can make some of the calculations explicit. So which means that we can uh, describe our elements in this bar group. And of course, this is quaternion algebras. This is just one special case of cyclic algebras. More generally, we can dis uh, we don't necessarily have to take two here, we can also take n here. So which means that we first find a cyclic extension, and then we define the character of the cyclic extension of degree n, and then we can define like similar uh, notions of cyclic algebras. And also it gives elements in bra group, but in the n torsion parts of the bra group. And then actually we can generalize this notion to varieties, not only uh, Fields. Okay, so for X of variety, how do we define the bra group of this variety? Of course, here we, yes, of course, we can also have the version of interesting simple algebras in the sense that we can uh, find locally define it over an open subset. We just say that, okay, uh, find locally, this is the so, uh, simple central algebra of this set, it defines a, a sheaf, and then we want to uh, globally um, just uh, glue it together. But then actually, with this cohomological description, we have a more hands-on definition. We just define it to be the second etal cohomology of X with the coefficients, the module being the multiplicative group. So actually here, the etal cohomology generaliz generalizes Galois cohomology in the sense that if we just replace X by a field, um, actually the spec of this field, for example, if we take spec K, this gives us exactly the cohomological description of the bra group here. So that's the reason why it's a uh, natural generalization. And then this is functorial. And so this enables us to detect sometimes why we have local global principle fails. And actually here, of course, another question is how do we compute elements here? It's like even more abstract, but actually this um, actually lies in the function field of um, this X, because like we've talked about how to describe uh, bar, uh, elements in bar group in a, in a field. So actually, usually like in, in good cases, like so good means that X is like regular integral or no theorem scheme, okay. Okay, so you just you guys just think that it's a good variety, and so actually we can just uh, calculate its elements in in the in the function field, satisfying certain compatibility conditions given by co-dimensional one points. So this is the so-called uh, residue map. So which means that we look at elements in the bar group of the function field, satisfying certain uh, compatibility conditions in terms of the co-dimension one points, and then if they are satisfied, they do come from um, an element in the bra group of X. Yes, question? Oh, what's the module again? Oh, yes, it's Q over Z. Sure. Yeah, oh, Q over Z. Okay, and then it's the time to de describe the bra money obstruction. Now we've seen two separated sessions of local global principle and bra group, and of course, we want to collect them together. And actually, here, what we want to use is the essential information of the of the of the relation between global bra group and local bra groups. So actually, from class field theory, so which means that here we look at a number field K, we have a exact sequence. Uh, actually, um, in order to define the, obstru the obstruction, we don't um, 
we don't necessarily want this to be exact, but it is enough for this to be a complex. Okay, we'll see why. So let us just fix one element in the bra group of X and also a set of local points. So actually one local point, okay, we'll write it like this. So this is a local point. This is just a morphism from spec KV to X. So actually it induces a map from the bra group of X to the bra group of KV. And so we have an element A, which is mapped to certain element here that we denote by A, K, V. So here, if we, do, if we complete this map, so just imagine that we possibly have a non-empty set here, but we don't know if, it's, if, it's, if it is non-empty or not. So we said that we go from, so, so we look at one element in the bra group of X, and then for each collect, uh, collection of local points, actually this point maps to, uh, this element maps to an element here, okay? And then if we go further, if we compose this with this, the, the, the variant map, we have had some elements here. So which means that we, we get some composition like this. And then if this element, this global point, does come from a global point, what would it mean? It would, means that, it would mean that this actually has a composition like this, but since this is a commutative diagram, it's the same to go like this. But this is a complex, which means that it should vanish here. So which means that if this set comes from, if this, uh, Sorry, I'll write XV here. So if we have a collection of local points, which is actually in the image of XK, which means that they do glue together to give a, local, uh, a global point, actually <coughs> the pairing with this element in the bra group should vanish here. Okay, so this is what this commutative diagram gives. So this enables us to define the Brahmanian uh, the Brahmanian set. Uh, actually, there are like some technical issues, uh, in the sense that sometimes we don't know if this set, uh, if this, um, if this sum is uh, is uh, finite or not. So sometimes, for example we will impose some finiteness conditions either on X or on bra group. So one condition that we can impose on bra group is that we just look at the unramified bra, uh, elements in the bra group. And so which, uh, which, uh, which guarantees that at the end, we can have a finite sum if we just look into uh, infinitely many of uh, local places, or either we just look at uh, identity points of X, which means that um, most of them are just in the, Okay, which means that most of them are actually integral. So which means that we have automatic vanishing. There are only uh, finitely many of them which lie in actually KV and so which could give non-zero elements here. Okay, so here I'll just write uh, the definition uh, with respect to identity points. So this is the set of local points such that the sum of this pairing under this invariance map, invariant map is equal to zero, okay? Or rather we can say that actually we have a pairing of local points and the bar group X, which goes into Q over Z. What, how is it defined? It's defined by this commutative diagram. I take one element here and then I take an element here. So this induces, uh, so elements from here induces um, maps here. 
And so which means that one map from here, uh, one element here is mapped by elements from here to bar local bar groups, which then lands into Q over Z. Okay, so this is the Brahmanian pairing. And then actually this is just the, the, uh, the left kernel of this pairing. Okay, so in some sense, it gives a compatibility condition for global points, where global points should lie in the set of local points. Okay, so actually we have an inclusion like this. So which means that at the very beginning, like naively, if local global principle holds, it would mean that actually we have an equality throughout, but it's not this case. Uh, in most of these cases, actually, we have a proper strict inclusion here. So which means that the Brahmani set actually is a proper subset of the set of um, local points. And so actually, if we have this non-empty, for example, if this is non empty, but this is empty, we could say already that we do not have any global points. And so this defines the local, uh, the, the Brahmanian obstruction to, to local global principle. And sometimes even better, this can give a sufficient condition. So if we have the non-emptiness of X over K equivalent to having an element in the Brahmani group, we say that the Brahmani obstruction to local global principle is the only one. And then the same question for um, for weak approximation. So I think you guys could already guess. We want to know about the closure of this inside these sets. And actually in good cases, we can prove that actually this is indeed closed. So which means that the closure of this one should lie in this Brahmani set. So of course, if this is not, if the Brahmani offset is a proper subset of this one, of course, we cannot hope that this is dense in the set of um, local points. And so which means that we say that the Brahmani obstruction is the only one for weak approximation if the closure of global points is actually equal to the set of the Brahmani set. Okay, so this is the classical setting in number uh, in number fields, and so in my work actually we've been looking uh, at uh, fields more of geometric shape and especially over complex fields. Okay, now we go beyond number fields. Can we still have the same notion of local global principle, the same notion of weak approximation, and the failure, and how do we find obstructions? So here actually fields that we can consider. So I just give some examples. For example, if we have a complex surface, uh, we can look at the, the function fields of this complex surface, for example, the projective plane, so which would give C over C of X, Y, or like some double covers with F just being an element here. Or sometimes, because sometimes these kind of fields still seem difficult to consider, we can also consider formal power series. So in some sense, they are, they are easier to, to handle. Or sometimes, okay, so these fields seem a little bit strange. So which means that we consider the base field to be the formal power series with one variable. And then we look at 
the function fields of a curve defined over this field. Okay, so so one prototype is just like this for first power series uh, with, with respect to the first variable and then the second variable. And so actually these two fields, they behave in a very similar way. And so that's the reason why we consider this kind of like seemingly strange fields, but actually it gives much more information about like the same amount of information as we can know for this field. And actually to understand these field, uh, we can say that this some kind of prerequisites to know more information about this more natural uh, field of field function fields of geometric uh, of geometric fields, and then furthermore we can we can look at, for example, uh, fields of uh, function fields of a curve over a piatic field. So we have all kinds of uh, generalizations, and of course the the question is why do we want to generalize what kind of similarities do they share with number fields if it doesn't share anything of course um, it's not interesting it's just like we invent problems but here actually we especially so if we look at these fields they do have a lot of properties in common with number fields so firstly they have the same called cohomological dimension they have cohomological dimension two so which is the same as the number field case so which means that uh, we also hope to have this kind of um, um, of uh, complex relating the bra group, the local bra group, and the global bra group, and so which is indeed the case. So which means that actually we can also define such notions of of bra. So we we also have the uh, we also have uh, similar okay I think I already wrote it somewhere here okay so which means that we also have some kind of relations between h2 of the oh no it's not here sorry it's the yeah it's here okay so it's the h2 of this field globally related to the h2 of the local completions landing in some coefficients like this. Actually, we can also prove similar results because here actually we have geometric uh, objects um, lying down. So we have a surface, so we have a curve. And so here it's very natural to define the set of uh, places. So which means that, for example, if we have a curve, the set of places are just like in natural correspondence with the closed points. If we have a surface and then the set of places, we can take them in to be the set of co-dimension one points. So which are uh, so so which are divisors so lines on this on this surface. And so actually, in this case, we can really uh, translate the we can really parallel parallelly uh, paraphrase the, the, the problem that we stated there. And so, for example, if we look at uh, fields like this, so we do have counter examples to local global principle. So which means that, so for example, here, we have that local global principle is not satisfied for it feels like this. Or actually, if you guys want, I can give you a very explicit construction. And also actually, uh, now I'm still working on how to explain this uh, failure. And so it's kind of some kind of like open problems. If people are interested, you can contact me if you have some ideas about this uh, calculation. So actually we work first on a quadratic extension of this field. So here F is some kind of, um, equations uh, defining elective curves. Oh, I just take some random example. So it's like, in some sense, it's a double cover. So some just some random numbers. So as long as they are not algebraically uh, independent, it's good. And so we first look at the field. So maybe we can name it L. So this is K. So which is a quadratic extension of this one. And then actually we have a very explicit um, objects defining a torsor over a torus.
So this is a tosser under this torus. So actually we can show that uh, this is an element in this family of varieties such that we do have local points everywhere, but we do not have a global point. And actually this essentially comes from the fact that the symbol XY is unramified. It's unramified and then we can show that actually um, it is trivial in all of the local, uh, in all of the local fields, but it is not, uh, it is not trivial. In, uh, it is not trivial over over L, and so this would give a counterexample to local global principle. And actually, uh, and then why we can define another counterexample over K because this is just like uh, uh, L is a, a quadratic extension. We just take the restriction of this variety. We have a variety defined over k, and so uh, actually uh, here we can uh, sing this variety of degree two. So here it would be a variety of degree four, and actually we can show that just by taking the veil restriction, it gives us a counterexample to the local global principle. And so of course we want to uh, use the Brahmanian abstraction, and here actually uh, the very natural way. Uh, so when looking into pro problems of uh, broad money obstruction, we first want to look at uh, good elements, for example, the unramified uh, elements in the bra group. And um, so um, it is already shown that this cannot work because we have a subjection from the bra group of K to the unramified bra group of X. So, so why? This suggestion would imply that there is no Brahmanian abstraction with respect to the unramified part because it's exactly an, again with this diagram. So if we do have a suggestion uh, here in some sense, which means that it would always vanish here. Okay, so which means that whenever elements I take, they always come from an element here, and so of course they would va vanish here. And so in this sense, in this case, we cannot look for uh, elements in the Brahmani, uh, in the unramified Brahmani group. And so how do we detect the, uh, how do we detect if one element is, unram uh, is unramified or not? So actually uh, I've been working on this. So it, it, it is translated to the problem of detecting certain symbols because uh, we've talked about quaternions. And so actually it means that we want to find uh, elements A and B independent such that we have a vanishing of this symbol in the bar group of two. And so I'm not sure, so that's the reason why I'm here for help. And so, so for example, we've seen a lot of computational tools to calculate this kind of, uh, this kind of field, uh, this kind of, for example, quaternion algebras and also these symbols. But the problem is that here we, we work over uh, fields of a special shape. It's not really a uh, rational field. It's not really just like numbers, but we work with functions. So which means that here are elements A and B, they are functions. So they are, um, so they have indeterminants X and Y. And so can we still uh, describe this symbol and decide if they are trivial or not, or can we just, uh, can we manipulate with these symbols to, 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 to detect uh, the group uh, operations of these symbols. And so uh, actually this is like, we have a nice presentation of this field. It's just general, generated by the, by, the, uh, by the symbols with relations A and Y, one, one minus A. And so I'm wondering if we can do something ex explicit. Okay, so this is the case for, um, for this very natural two-dimensional geometric fields. Um, so I still have 10 minutes, right? I think we, we become like, uh, okay, 10 minutes later. And so actually here uh, for fields like this, 
Um, I have uh, already some positive results, but it's uh, not explicit. Okay, uh, so it's less related to uh, the theme of this workshop, but I just want to show you guys a little bit how do we usually work uh, with these kind of problems of Brahman obstruction. And so I'm very sorry that I'll just like, uh, uh, well, I'll just uh, overwhelm you guys with some slides, but because it's just to show like a flavor of how this kind of, um, uh, how this kind of problem usually works without any explicit methods. So actually, so, so here K is the field that I mentioned of this shape or of this shape. Okay, so here this uh, known result of Collio Telen and David Ari. And so they say that there is, um, so this is the problem of weak approximation. So which means that we want to describe the closure of the set of global points to see if they lie uh, uh, to see that um, how can we uh, describe this closure in the set of global points. So they give, uh, so they, they give a very explicit um, uh, exact sequence, which tells you exactly where they lie. Okay, so this actually is just some kind of uh, variation of bra group. So this is the so-called locally constant bra group. Also in general, it's just like some, some parts of the bra group where we can guarantee that the parent is finite. And so um, this, uh, this jewel means, means that because like we have a pairing between this one and this one. So this jewel means that it lies in the kernel in some sense. So if I just like translate this exact sequence, it says that we do have a Brahman obstruction to weak approximation for torus defined over K of the shape that I just mentioned. Okay. And so in my work, actually, I generated, uh, I generalized this to all the connected linear group, uh, not only Taurus, but how do we do? I think we've also seen this kind of uh, techniques that we mentioned, I think, last week. Uh, it says that actually we have kind of like devisage argument. It's like, actually, we want to uh, decompose our group into several parts. And then if we can prove such results for each building block and then using uh, techniques from uh, diagram chasing or this kind of uh, this kind of properties, uh, giving you properties translating from uh, these two components to G, and then we can prove it for G. Okay, so first we can uh, divide G into the unipotent part and then the reductive part, and then we can show that like um, this part actually is trivial, and so we only have to deal with the re reductive part, and then we still De decompose G, the, a reductive group, into some kind of like nice resolution such that each part actually can satisfy or we can prove uh, such properties of each part easily using either, for example, um, some other techniques we already know or like the, the known results for tori. And then at the end, we can get um, the answer for this group. So actually, this is not... Uh, uh, What's wrong? Okay, sorry. Okay, so actually here, it's not very difficult to uh, do like this, uh, as long as we already have this kind of like techniques from uh, resolutions like flask resolution or coflex resolution, which means that finding um, suitable uh, exact sequences, which can decompose your group in question into some nicer groups uh, over which we can already know answers of this field. And then, of course, we still want to generalize this. And then I found out that if we look at not only groups, but homogeneous spaces, they do not necessarily satisfy this uh, uh, Brahman obstruction. So which means that now Brahman, Brahman obstruction doesn't work. We have to look for more obstructions. And so uh, this is more tedious work. So which means that we have to build certain tossers. And then actually we can have uh, information from certain maps, subjective maps, which tells you the information of your variety. And so I just want to show you guys like the shape of obstruction that we can have at the end. So which is very different from the classical Brahmani obstruction. So which means that here, actually we define an obstruction which takes into account all of these kinds of maps, uh, subjective maps or torsos to be more precise, which gives you where uh, the place of uh, uh, the closure of the global points should be. So it characterizes the locus of the 
closure of this um, of this global point. And then going beyond these uh, fields of co-dimension or cohomological dimension two, we've seen that actually if we work with uh, with fields of this, actually this field has co a cohomological dimension three. Why? Because QP already is of dimension two, and then we just add another, uh, another variable. And so for this one, actually, we do not work with bra groups, which means that we do, not with, we do not work with H2, but we rather work with H3. And so, of course, the first question is, do we have the complex uh, of the style of class field theory? The, the question is, yes, we do have something like this. So global H3, to local H3, and then we have some kind of uh, residue maps going to H2 and eventually to H1. And so we have like such uh, complexes or exact sequences, which enables us to define uh, the abstraction, cohomological uh, uh, abstraction over this kind of fields. But over this field, it's even more difficult with problems coming from our non-abelian cohomology, because in this set, uh, because in because in the cases we've we've uh, looked here, actually we still have very nice non-abelian cohomology in the sense that, for example, if we have semi-simple simply connected groups, they don't give um, any cohomology in terms of H1, H2. But here it's not the case. Even for simply connected semi-simple groups, actually they can have. Uh, non-trivial cohomology and so the problem is how to tangle with them and so that's also like one of the projects that I'm still working on and so I guess my time is almost up and so I'm up for questions thank you very much questions But the field, first example, yeah. of an equation that does not satisfy Oh, yes, yes. Actually, yes, it, it's a very good question because I, I forgot to mention how can we tangle it with the Brahman abstraction. So actually, there is one element that we can find in the Brahman group. Uh, okay, yes, I'm very sorry. Yes, I mentioned it somewhere. Right here. Right here. Oh yes, it's this one. So actually we can define an element in a bra group with symbols like this, because I already said that in the bra group of X, actually we define some uh, elements first in the uh, bra group of the function field. So actually here Y is one element in the function field because uh, yes. And then actually using this uh, element in the bra group, we can do explicit computations to show that um, the parent doesn't vanish, and so we have a Brahman instruction. Yeah, so you guys can check. Actually, it's very easy in the sense that how do we evaluate uh, this element? It's basically that we just replace y with this relation, actually. Yeah, and you guys can play around a little bit with these symbols. So that's the reason why I think that it should be doable in some sense over like uh, the fields of C of x, y, because we also manipulate with symbols like this, but the only problem is that we manipulate with factors of over c rather than over numbers, and so I'm not sure if it is doable, but yeah, I hope so. Yes. So, uh, so Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So you mean that, uh, so for higher case, which means that the cohomological dimension of uh, this already high. Okay, so actually we do have uh, what's, uh, uh, actually this is the so-called reciprocity uh, abstraction defined by Coyote-Len. 
Um, and actually in this case, so like uh, Colin said, show that we do have this kind of complex and then actually we just go like two steps. It's exactly uh, what you described. It's like uh, we have N and then we have the residue map which goes to N minus one and then goes to N minus two. And so we should have this kind of vanishing. And um, of course uh, here, actually I already looked at this case in H2 like defined by this reciprocity obstruction. And so it doesn't work here. And also, but this does provide um, a natural scheme for higher, uh, um, for, for higher cases. Actually, Koyo Telen said in his paper that he defined this one because it's very natural. It's just like a, a higher generalization of this mule of K2, but he didn't find examples such that he could apply this to, uh, to explain more examples. Uh, and so like he, uh, at that time, he didn't provide any example, but then in a, a upcoming paper, it's exactly with this title. It's like, uh, yeah, uh, uh, it's like obstruction de reciprocité. And so like he gave one example, um, I think of, uh, of dimension three or something. Yes. But, but the, the question is, what is the relationship with the capital of this? Uh, well, what do you mean by, by that? Yeah. Ah, okay, I see. Object of okay. So question, mm -hmm. uh, with this approach, is it easier to get uh, mm -hmm. information or not? Uh, what is the limitation? Okay, I think I have to look into uh, that uh, 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 into detail because what I have in mind is like uh, also a uh, complex relating this HN and then to the uh, the like um, local information of HN. Is that this complex or uh, yeah, I mean, is that possible here? Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Okay, yes, 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 yes. Okay, okay. So it should be what I have in mind. So, which means that, yes, this is actually, this corresponds to uh, the case of class field uh, of this, just this um, uh, here. So, which enables us to define the obstruction. So, which means that it's just like one part in with which we can define the obstruction, but it doesn't like uh, give answers to the local global principle itself. It's like we should use this kind of complex and then we can define obstructions with it. Yeah. Actually here, more generally, uh, we don't even have cohomological um, uh, obstruction in the sense that as long as we have some functors applied to the global information and the local information and some kind of compatibility conditions like this, we can define obstructions as long as we have a functor satisfying certain um, uh, certain uh properties like this so the thing is how to find such good functors for the moment the bra group seems to work well and of course we can have higher uh higher cohomological ones and also there are so-called descent obstructions for those who are interested but yes there's a story of how to define all kinds of obstructions and also to compare the relations among them Yes, but we, we can discuss more when I see yeah. like more in detail. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you very much.